know about the, 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 big, the orange. Um, we, I grew up in Southwest Florida, though, um, in Fort Myers, Naples area. I, um, I'm 36 years old. I was educated um, in, public, in Catholic schools my whole life. I'm trying to figure this out. Usually I have a little button that works here. But um, I served in the Marine Corps, and I earned up to the rank of sergeant. I was um, uh, honorably discharged, and I went to Ave Maria University and got a degree in theology. I wanted to... Um, I, I, I thought about being a drill instructor, actually, and I prayed about it, thought about it, and um, right before I signed the last three letters of my last name, I never, I kind of forgot when I was in the fervor of the fun of the Marine Corps, blowing things up and everything, that, um, that before I went in the Marine Corps, I was discerning the priesthood. And I thought, well, I never finished discerning the priesthood, and maybe I didn't even really consider that. I should probably pause on this. So I signed everything up to the last, letter, last three letters of my last name, and then I stopped, and I said, wait, I need to pray about this. So I went and prayed, and I talked to my spiritual director at the time, and, and um, he said, Martin, there's definitely a war going on, but I need you to think about which war you want to participate in, because that's your life's work right here. There's the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that will one day end. But there's a cultural war happening, and it's happening in the battlefields of the classroom, and that's really the battlefield that I chose to devote my life to, and this is why I became a principal. At Ave Maria, my uh, ethics professor, where I've learned most of what I'm about to talk about tonight, um, he said that, um, if, do you really want to save souls, Martin? And I said, yes. And he said, then become, an, not a college professor like you want to become, become an elementary uh, uh, teacher. Don't even become a high school teacher. They've already made up their minds, just like college students have made up their minds. Elementary students have not made up their minds yet, and you could still form them. So we kept walking. Actually, it was a, a Jesuit named Father Robert McTagg. But he, as we're walking, he, um, he eventually stopped and said, do you really, really want to save souls? And I said, yes. He said, then become a principal. Because you can do everything you want to do in that one year. But then the next year, um, another person has them. And maybe that person isn't really uh, mission-oriented, perhaps, the way you are. But you, if you're a principal, you can hire a bunch of mission-oriented individuals. And you can prevent bad teachers from teaching bad things, and you can bring in good teachers, and, and this has really been uh, kind of my goal here. And in a way, I see myself as the primary, uh, the secondary educator, obviously, for all the children here. It's, it's my responsibility. No stones are at stake, which we'll talk about in a moment. And so um, this is why I got into education. I first started at an all-boys boarding school called Subiaco Academy in Arkansas. Um, and uh, I was the head of the theology department and the, and the head dorm dean there, so I was like the dean of students after school, after hours, where that was kind of my, where I got, I got forged through the, the fires of 24-7 uh, work almost. I made 25,000 that year, and I worked from one o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the morning, or uh, one o'clock in the morning is when I went to bed, and five o'clock in the morning is when I woke them up for uh, rosary and morning prayer, and, and so I don't even know how I functioned. So the fourth grade is then where I moved to, to Sugarland. That's what brought me to Texas, working at St. Teresa in Sugarland. And eventually I was asked to move up to seventh grade uh, homeroom. So that's kind of my background as a teacher. Um, I was married, I've been married for six years to my wife, Kimberly. And uh, I'm starting my second year as principal here at St. Clair of Assisi. And I moved to League City a year ago to better serve our school. That's a little about, about me. Um, so what we're about to talk about, and here's a quick overview. So uh, we're going to talk about the church's teaching on education itself. This will really help because um, if we don't understand how the church views education, then we won't understand what a Catholic school needs to be and, and should be and whether we're meeting that mark. Um, with parents as the primary educator, uh, all the more reason, actually you all should know more than I do in some ways, um, about the church's teaching on education. You're the primary educators. I don't have any kids. You do. And so... That's why you should, in some ways, that's probably why you're here. So uh, the five marks of the Catholic uh, education, things on the fridge, sorry about this. Five marks of Catholic education is the next thing we'll talk about. This is from Archbishop Miller. He recently wrote a book called The Holy See's Teaching on Education. And it, and it mainly highlights these five uh, marks of education. Every Catholic school in America is talking about this right now, and so I thought I'd bring you up to date. We also are going to talk about natural law, a real quick crash course on natural law and salvation history. Without knowing where the church came from and where it's going, salvation history, then we don't exactly know where we fit into um, this historical narrative. And so um, a 
parent as primary educator at one time in history has a diff different challenges and different um, opportunities than other primary educators in history. We also have natural law, of course. Um, if we don't understand our, uh, in the hierarchy of being, you could say, uh, with a proper anthropology, the understanding of who man is, what is a man, what is a, a woman, a human, then you might accidentally think that ma man is a god, or man is a demon, or man is a creature, just like any other brute animal, as um, Aristotle calls them. And so um, that is a, an animal without reason. And so um, a crash course on natural law will be helpful. Um, orthodoxy versus orthopraxy, um, that's, uh, we'll go into that, and because we have to have a kind of a, with a Venn diagram, you have to have both of those, a proper understanding of what is orthodoxy compared to heterodoxy. And what is orthopraxy compared to heteropraxy? Because if we don't know what those are, then we can't really self-assess. There's a virtue Thomas Aquinas mentions called circumspection, the ability to, spectio, the Latin is to look, and to circum is around. So to look back at oneself and then identify, am I doing the right things? It's kind of like a self-check. Um, that's actually a virtue that we all should have, and that's kind of the, the purpose of this section here. Then the precepts of the church. This is a checklist making sure that parents of the primary educator are fulfilling their responsibilities because you can't give what you don't have. And if, if you're not doing them, then some of the parents might, or your children might look to you as God has intended. You're the archetype of what a Catholic adult is, and they all look to you as their exemplar. And so um, if you're not doing the precepts of the church, um, once upon a time, you were looked at as a non-practicing Catholic. And so um, obviously you're here, so you're, you're, you're probably doing the precepts of the church. We also have lex orandi, lex credendi. Uh, that's Latin for the law of prayer is the law of belief, or law of prayer, law of prayer, law of belief. And we'll talk more about what that means. Finally, miles, uh, the millstone scandal and culpability. That's where I beat you with uh, some, some guilt there, Catholic guilt, rub your nose in a little bit. But also, it's not really that. I'm mainly showing you that this is deadly serious, uh, which you know, that's why you're here. And then we have educational philosophies, Protestant secular uh, slash public schools, you could say, and we'll have a question and answer session. Not that I'm the guru per se, but. So, ooh, I just really like this picture. I want to go back to it. I was flipping through stuff. That's Mrs. Samperi. That is our kindergarten teacher teaching the children in kindergarten the sign of the cross here at St. Clair. We're doing wonderful work here. We're going to talk about the Catholic Church's teaching on education. So, this is going to become, uh, I'm going to kind of try to run through this quickly because I don't want to bore you, but. We're going to talk about some papal encyclicals. I mainly just want to mention names so when you see them, you can go, oh, yeah, that was one of those. I can also share a link with you. We can put a piece of paper in the back. If you want my uh, presentation, you can. these are actually all hyperlinks. Oh, what have I done? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Hold on one second. I pushed the down button, but I might as well. I think it's searching for the output from the. Okay, so maybe I didn't do anything? Ah, yes. Okay, very good. Maybe I didn't push a button. Okay, so Spectata um, Fides is the first encyclical to really take note of. Um, and then Acerbo Nimis, that's another one. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them. Divini Ilius Magistri, that is uh, a, a third one. Now, there, the church talked about encyclicals before these ones, uh, or I should say, Popes wrote encyclicals about education before these ones, but they're very general. They were about general catechesis. They weren't about what you might think of a school with a bunch of children in desks with a teacher up front. They were just mainly almost like uh, faith formation, like Bible school or, or like uh, Wednesday CCE. It was mainly focused on that because parish schools um, weren't very pervasive at the time. They were... Um, especially in the New World, America, and other areas. And so um, as we understand it, people generally went to sometimes secular schools and then came to like a faith formation. Uh, before the formation of secular schools, I mean, the Catholic Church created the understanding of what school is. The university was created by the Catholic Church. And so uh, they boiled the university system, the idea of what a university is, down for children to some degree, and that was the beginnings of education. We'll go into that history. But... Um, so there wasn't a ton of encyclicals about the Catholic uh, education until this point. That's why Spectata Fides is kind of the first one. It's very short. Uh, encyclicals before the council are very short, concise, to the point, unlike my emails. 
and I'm working on it. But, um, but after the council, they're always see, the council documents are always seen as beautiful journeys that were like, you know, that, that were always unfolding and on, but nobody really fully knows really what they mean sometimes. And so you will start to see, not to be too crass, but over time, these encyclicals not only get longer in title, but also that more people are involved in their creation, which has some pros and cons, but also um, uh, they get much, much longer and much, much deeper. And that's, there's some pros and cons to that too. Uh, you, uh, you sometimes find yourself after reading some of these, well, what am I supposed to do? What are my major takeaways? The so what factor, right? You've stated a lot of things. And, and so uh, if you really want to just cut to the chase, some of these ones right basically here, not that Gravissimum Educationes is the Vatican Council II's document on Catholic education. It's wonderful. It gets to the point uh, much more than some of the ones after it. But um, anyway, I'll go into these a little bit. So, okay, so here we go. Leo the Thirteenth over here. He writes Spectata Fides in 19, um, 1885, um, 100 years before I was born. And then Pope Leaf, yeah, that's from Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Uh, yeah, the Thirteenth. We have the Cerebonimis in 1905. Um, and uh, by Pius X. And then we have Divini um, Ilius Magistri from um, Pius XI here in 1929. Notice there's a kind of a bigger gap between each of these because um, typically before, especially um, I guess about before 50 or 60 years ago, encyclicals were typically written when there was a problem and it was suiting a problem. It was answering a problem. So often these ones right here talk about the problem. Mainly, they talk about the rise of media, right? The, I mean, this has been, um, let me see, 400 years since Gutenberg's press, and so um, 400 years of the media uh, becoming the third estate, or fourth estate, you could say, claiming its, its, uh, its uh, role in influencing culture. And so, um, Spectata Fides um, was the beginning of the moving pictures, Cerebonimis even goes into that in, uh, explicitly, talking about how, um, Secular schools are sometimes influenced by socialism and progressivism, and basically right under the nose of the parents, the children are being um, um, catechized or taught with a worldview that is anti, not just different from Catholicism, anti-Catholic. And um, these are the reasons that they're writing these. Now eventually, um, and there's Pius the, um, of the 11th there. Now eventually with Gravissimum Educationis, which is the Second Vatican Council's document on education, um, that is a document that really focuses on um, the important role in that kind of the whole community is involved, but it does state that there are, there's a reason this is being written. There's a reason that this is one of the council documents of all the things we can talk about. This is how we make saints. This is how we make adult Catholics. This is how, yes, we make people putting collection and uh, tithing in the collection uh, basket, but also this is who becomes the next generations of teachers and, um, and parents who are raising the children. So, Education really is like the most important thing uh, for, for parents to do. Um, he writes this in 1965. Um, uh, you, you might say it's the entire council, but it was uh, mainly promulgated by Pius the Sixth, or uh, St. Paul the Sixth. Um, we have the Catholic school. This is the first one that's written by the Congregation for Catholic Education. Um, after the council, um, it, it Gravissimo Educationis called for a, kind of a, 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 a church organization or, or a, a, a Secretariat, you might say, on education to help uh, with this uh, endeavor, not just leave local churches, local ordinaries, that is bishops, to kind of um, try to fix this culture war, you could say. Because, um, I mean, if you think of what's going on, the, the 68 riots just happened uh, three years after the Second Vatican Council, and it already happened before the church finally, the council uh, congregation that was formed after the council actually got a document out. So um, this is, is something to consider, it's something to ponder about. Um, Kessi uh, Tridende, that is from John Paul II in 1979, a few years after that. Remember, um, rules are written um, because rules are, being, er, rules are being broken. So typically when we read in history, when s there's a law against a certain act, it's because people are doing that act. The more the church is writing about education, it's not only a welcoming of parents to to participate in their God-given role as teacher, as primary educator, but it's also saying, hey, look, there's also kind of something else going on in culture. If you're not doing it, someone else is, right under the nose of you. 
and um, lay Catholics in schools. This is around the time in 1982 where many of the teachers in Catholic schools are uh, Catholic lay people. And so you'd have uh, nuns and monks go for seven or more years sometimes of, of catechesis and, and deep prayer and training, and those were the educators in Catholic schools. Until around 1965, or a little before that, I'm sorry, a little after that, you start to have primarily lay people who are, you know, relatively catechized, some of them. Some of them have degrees in theology, but some of them don't. Some of the nuns didn't have degrees in theology, but there's something about the lifestyle of a nun that can hopefully encourage them to remain in a, a holy life, living in, con in, in, in uh, community together. Lay people, they go home to their homes or to their spouses who may or may not be equally yoked to them. So this is a, a, a unique challenge that the church will start to see is writing more and more about Catholic education after this, especially when lay people take over. I mean, I'm a lay person and used to be an educator, so I, I'm not knocking lay educators, but there's a pro and a con to that. They're more relatable to the children sometimes when it's a mom or a dad who's the teacher, but also they tend to be less catechized sometimes. They tend to be um, busy with their life. They have to pay the bills, whereas the community tends to be able to do that for the nuns or the monks. And so there's kind of a pro and a con there. And um, so the Catholic Church is teaching on education. We're moving on to John Paul II, St. John Paul II's uh, 1990 Ex Corde Ecclesiae. This is my alma mater, and their motto is Ex Corde Ecclesiae. So this document is very important, especially if you ever went to a uh, university or Catholic university. This is where Pope John Paul II invites the church to consider, with that circumspection, um, the, the state of Catholicity inside of the universities. And so um, this is when uh, the Newman Guide, uh, after this, um, the Newman Guide is a list um, written by the Newman um, Society, Carmel Newman Society, where they basically assess the Catholicity of universities. If you're going to send your kid to a Catholic university, you want to make sure it's, it's on the, the Newman Guide list. Um, and so the Newman Guide was, was an, an, kind of a call or an answer to the call from Ex Corde Ecclesia, from Pope John Paul II. The General Directory for Catechesis, this is not only for Catholic education uh, in schools, it's just for all kind of Catholic educators. And the reason, again, why am I telling you about this, it's mainly because you guys are the primary educator if you're a parent. So I, I would invite you to look at that the way that the superintendent invited me to look at this and the way I invited my teachers to look at this and we go through this at faculty meetings. I, I can't have you sit at one of my faculty meetings and go through it with us. That's kind of a challenge as well. You're gonna have, you could go over it with your spouse. You could go over it with your, your maybe your mother or father and, and do a, an after action report as we used to say in the military. Like, hey, how'd you do, mom? Let's look at how you raised me as primary educator and, and, then, and then you can, let me know some pro tips, having gone through that, and then I can carry that into my upbringing, or, or my rearing of, of my own children, your grandchildren. Maybe you wouldn't want to do that, though, I don't know. Sure. Okay, so moving on, in 2007, um, in 2015, and 2022, these are the most recent um, uh, curial documents and uh, encyclicals on education, Catholic education. I'll send you these links. Okay, I, I didn't actually ask, uh, the Karash family, but that was so cute that I just was like, okay, I have to put this. This is one of our students with um, a priest in the Archdiocese, Father Felix, at the Annunciation. Some of you who I figured go here might know him. Um, the five marks of Catholic education. Um, number one, it has to be inspired by a supernatural vision. So why did they pick that over? They only had five shots, five different choices to define Catholic education compared to non-Catholic education. And again, as parents, you're the primary educator, you're in school all the time when you're with your children. And you're doing professional development when you're alone from your children. So, um, inspired by a supernatural vision, this is a vision primarily set on achieving heaven, not achieving a high paying job later in life. And so that tends to be the big juxtaposition there. It's like, what is my goal as a parent? To ensure that they're set up for success later in life? Sure, yes. But also to make sure that they achieve heaven. And look, you can do both of those, they are not uh, opposites, and that's actually the goal. Because if you um, raise kind of a molly coddled uh, child who's a, a, a little saint, but they're not able to take care of themselves, are they ex uh, be able or being able to uh, show all the virtues, to have all the virtues? Have you inculcated those in your home life? The church sees education as a process that, in light of man's transcendent destiny, forms the whole child and seeks to fix his or her eyes on heaven. So that's kind of the key there. Founded on Christian anthropology. I mentioned that before. Anth anthropos in Greek means man. Ology just means the study of man. So, this, so um, or ology means the study of. So the study
study of man. So anthropology would be understanding man's kind of like role in all of creation. And so founded in Christian anthropology, and this is from a Catholic document, and they often don't say Catholic anthropology, they say Christian, meaning Catholic, because we are the, 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 the you might say, the fullness of, of, of Christianity. So we have uh, teamwork. That means this is not an individual effort of mom. Um, this is a, an individual, this is like a group team effort. There's a whole faculty at your house, and that's both mom and dad, equally yoked. Also grandparents. We also have aunts and uncles. And if you have, just like if I have a teacher who's, you know, got a mohawk and a, and, and a Def Leppard shirt on and coming in with like torn up jeans and playing rock music, and that's their classroom, that, that kind of is, is full of um, just anarchy and craziness, but then they go to all these well-ordered classrooms of, of throughout the day, you can see that that, dis, that juncture right there, that one faculty member kind of spoils the whole thing. Well, the same thing goes for your family. We can have some people that cause scandal, and this we have to be aware of this sometimes. Um, that aunt and uncle that don't fully understand that they are, by extension, faculty members in your domestic church, your domestic school. Um, we have uh, cooperation from, between educators and bishops. And so, yes, uh, in some ways, you don't have to be a member of a, a teacher in your homeschool co-op or your homeschool to, to realize that just as my boss, because I'm, I work in a Catholic school, is the bishop, your boss, as, as a, a primary educator, is the bishop in helping guide you, helping form you in, in your faith so that you can be um, a better Catholic educator. Uh, interaction of students and teachers. So this means that you have to be uh, uh, consistently um, engaged with your, your student, you could say, your child. And um, so being on your phone is essentially what came to mind here, or while watching movies together, instead of forming them, taking them fishing, have, go play tennis in your neighborhood if you got a tennis court. Hanging out with and forming your child. Remember that children used to be raised, uh, back in the day when we were hunter-gatherers, men learned, boys learned to be men from their, their fathers who would go out and on the hunt, right? And then eventually, and women would learn how to be, uh, or daughters would learn how to be women and mothers when they would go and take care of their 13 sibling, uh, siblings as they would go and, and gather things uh, outside the cave. Eventually, we go into an um, agrarian lifestyle where the son would go out into the fields and milk the, the cows and take care of the goats, but also um, uh, till the soil with their fathers. And they learned that what, what is a, an injury that's okay and an injury that's not okay. They would do rough and tumble play out in the fields. And, and this is the way uh, God intended. That's the schoolhouse. That is the organic schoolhouse of humanity. It's not this inorganic classroom setting where we have the kids sit down all day. We're aware of this. This is why we added 15 more minutes of unstructured playtime this year. We added PE every day when we only had it a couple times a day because we cannot deny that this is how children um, are raised. If we are the secondary educators. You're the primary educators. Cooperation, uh, interaction with students and teachers. If the teacher is always on their phone, which we never allow, but if the teacher is on their phone, the primary educator, or just watching Netflix as a family, but you're never interacting with them, that's not organic. You're, you're losing opportunity. Um, when I first came here as a, as a principal, I noticed some children write their, their name like this in a weird way. And I, I was like, what is going on here? Well, children have an opportunity, a window, where they can learn a good habit. They can't write before this. they got to write like this, like a caveman. But eventually, they get the fine motor skills to be able to write. And if you miss that window to form that habit of how to hold the pen properly or the pencil properly, you um, now they got weird habits and they write goofily. And um, you have windows. You have windows with your children. And um, you can't just drop them off necessarily with, with their teachers because we don't have all of the opportunities for those windows. We are with them for most of their waking hours, but there's some uh, content, curricular norms, you could say, that only really a parent can teach. And we can try to do our best with that, but primary educator really is the, the, the right person for that. The physical environment, that is not a 73 uh, degree environment where um, everything's soft and padded and things like this, like to go out and allow them to thermoregulate, to be in nature as God intended, and to interact with the physical environment with them, um, this teaches them about the world in, in, in kind of a natural way that we intended. I'm boiling this down um, for parents, the primary educator, but we as faculty talk about this in a, in a different way. 
uh, animated by communion and community. Love for wisdom, passion for truth. So love is a, another name for the Holy Spirit. The love between the Father and the Son becomes incarnate. And then the love between God and, the, and humanity is the Holy Spirit. It's not like... It's not brought to us by the Holy Spirit. It is the person of the Holy Spirit. Love for wisdom. Wisdom is another name for the Holy Spirit here. And so love brings wisdom. And passion for truth, with a capital T, that is other, another name for God, but particularly the Holy Spirit. So you can see, this is, and when the Holy Spirit is there, Satan is called the scatterer is a nickname for him. But when the Holy Spirit is here, we come together and we are, there's unity. Not only in the school, where there's peace, and kids aren't hitting each other and throwing things, but also um, at home as well. And really, frankly, if there is love, uh, you know, wisdom, truth, passion for truth in the home, uh, there will be in the school. The school is an outgrowth of the domestic school. And so if there's lack of structure in the home and all these other things, we're trying to contain it, but the fire's already started. And so um, you know, that's just something to consider. And faith, culture, and life, he, he, they go into that a little bit. And viewed with a Catholic worldview, Throughout its curriculum, you have a curriculum to, what is it, what is the phrase? To fail to plan is to, is to plan to fail. If you don't know your curriculum, and that curriculum is not founded yeah. upon a Catholic yeah. worldview, then you're in, you're kind of accidentally, you're kind of back in your way down the hallway, bouncing into the walls, and who knows where, which classroom or what room that's going to lead into. And so we want to make sure that we're deliberately looking for this. You don't have to be a theologian to read theology. There's, there's simple spiritual works that you can read and read the reviews and stuff and pick that up. There's some advanced ones as well and it'll make you, your eyes cross. I know it does for me. But, but reading the lives of the saints and also the words of the saints, um, their writings themselves, is a great place to start. Sustained by gospel witness. So hiring committed Catholics, or in this case, bringing committed Catholics around your children. They um, inculcate, they in a way like dry the cement of what you've laid in your child's mind with cement being um, a Catholic worldview, Catholic doctrine. And so if other people come around, uh, this is kind of what you, what you use teachers for, making sure you choose a good, authentic Catholic school because they carry out in action, the teachers, what you're teaching at home is the idea. Transparent witness of, of life. Um, this just means supporting life not only in nature and in the environment, but also in, in supporting of, uh, obviously, pro-life causes and things like this. And when you are authentic, authentically Catholic, there's an, uh, an uh, outgrowth of, 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 of uh, love and life. Okay, finally, complementing the primary role of parents in educating their children, such schools build up community of, a community of believers, evangelize the culture, and serve the common good of society. When you're doing all of these things, it's not the goal of doing these. I should say this is not the goal of doing these. This is more like an outgrowth of that, that your family will go out and build up a community of believers. You will evangelize the culture. You'll serve the common good of society. So natural law of salvation, you can see there's children dressed up as saints here. They look like Dominicans. You have uh, Pope Pius X says, the, the church alone, being the bride of Christ and having all things in common with her divine spouse, is the depository of truth. So um, the church is where to look for in understanding um, uh, man's role in society, man's place in society. So first, we'll start with law. Law is, um, God is law. God is, um, when things, when laws are in conformity to God and his nature, then they are good laws. And when they are not in conformity with God and his nature, they are bad laws. So you can see eternal law is God. It's the, it's the ordering of it. It's his will being carried out in the universe and even within himself. But moral laws are, when, are all laws for humans that are in conformity with that. We call those moral laws. Now, there's two kinds. There's the laws that are from God, that is revealed laws in the Bible, like the Ten Commandments, and then there's natural law in the universe. That's usually the one that parents get wrong, uncatechized people get wrong. They, they are formed by the media, and they are, their understanding of nature is warped, unfortunately, especially with education. I mean, ed, uh, teachers, university professors are not known for being like arch conservatives, typically. So, so you might have gotten bitten by some progressive worldviews, and you might accidentally be teaching those. 
purposely, but kind of not aware of what's what happening. Um, and, and it might not be in conformity with natural law. Well, how do you know if you're wrong about something? You double check what natural law is. You understand, you, you, natural law is essentially um, the universe as it is. And we conform our mind, our worldview, to natural law. Um, so natural law is, uh, for instance, uh, gra gravity is a part of natural law. The, the way, well, that's more physics than that laws of matter, actually. Natural law is the way animals interact. It's the way that humans interact and things like this. Um, laws in nature, the way things are. Um, we also have laws for men. Those are two. There's civil law and there's ecclesial law, ecclesiastical law made by the church. And these are made by men. Um, civil law and history, you can, it, it's sort of, it, there's Himurabi's code, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Well, that's not in conformity with God's eternal law. That, that goes through these kind of steps. And so that is an unjust law. And this is the standard. God himself is the standard of all law. Okay, finally, oh, so the big takeaway from this is it matters not who makes the laws if the law itself is not in conformity with eternal law. Um, that just makes it who, you know, um, the, the kind of whoever is, is in charge at that moment is defining the law. So finally, salvation history. Salvation history is a way to look at history. It's uh, the way that the church often looks at history. So if you're looking at history as your professors in the History Channel teach you, then you um, should look into salvation history. Salvation history starts with prehistory, and then it goes to the patriarchs, and finally, uh, not finally, but then to the slaver slavery of the Israelites, and then Exodus, then escaping, you know, let my people go. Um, with Moses, then we go to the law, the age of the judges, then the kings and the prophets. It's all the Old Testament, but finally here's the New Testament with Jesus, and then the early church, and it actually goes on. I couldn't find a picture that goes on, but basically um, we're in an age right now. Um, I mean, Saint Paul thought the second coming was coming in his lifetime, and every saint um, thinks that, that that Christ is coming in their lifetime. And we learn from the saints that it's very good to basically presume that God could be coming at any moment. We know not the, the day nor the hour. So that affects how you interact with your child. That affects how you teach your child. If you think that we're going to be here forever and, um, you know, the, the kind of Big Bang created everything and we're just going to be spinning around for billions of years, well, who knows? That's going to change your understanding of, of morality and that you always have to be prepared for Christ to come. Oftentimes, we're preaching two gospels. We're preaching kind of a physical reductionist gospel as well as a gospel of, like, our faith. And so we don't know how to reconcile these two. And that really needs to happen in the teachers here at the school when we teach, but also in the home, the teachers in the home. So yeah, it's integral to have a Catholic worldview of natural law and salvation history to understand one's place in creation and the timeline in, in the timeline from creation until the second coming. Without this, our worldview is ego-focused. If you're not focused on uh, Christ coming again and focusing on the uh, eternal salvation and trying to um, live a holy, virtuous life um, to attain that, then you start to just focus on the here and now. And really, this is the most common three things I always tell the, my teachers. Your children are focused on three things. To be comfortable, to be well-fed, and to be entertained. And, if, and it's pretty much in that order. If, so if, they're, if they're being bitten up by ants, that is the number one thing they're worried about. But once that's fine, well, then they're, they're hungry. And, um, and once they're done being hungry, well, I'm bored. And, and that's just, I mean, it's, it's roughly the Maslow's hierarchy of needs in some way. And so, um, that, but there's other things to worry about with your child other than those three. But because we're so busy, we tend to only focus on those three. Once they're comfortable, well fed, and entertained, our job is done. Now I can cook, or now I can get the, pay, the bills paid or whatever we're doing. But there's another thing after that. And um, being present with your child, living as, a, as an exemplar of the faith that you are, that they see you, they see you as that. And so, you know, if, if you were trying to raise your children to love a sport you're into, let's say you're into figure skating. Well, you're gonna take your daughter or son, I guess, to the, the ice rink and you're gonna do your dance on the ice and spin around and do your triple axel because you want them to love what you love. That's the way God intended it. If you love being a Catholic, you're gonna take them to the figurative ice and, and do your little dances. You're gonna do the Catholic things. Well, what are those Catholic things? St. Thomas, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas calls those the, um, 
um, uh, forms of religion called um, uh, what is this? Uh, observances. Observances. So you're going to have, have a pious life. You're going to want to pray the rosary with your child. You're going to want to read the Bible from a Catholic perspective. You're going to want to read the lives of the saints. That's you dancing on ice. I never thought of that example. I don't know why I'm going into figure skating. I <laughs> just like a hidden pursuit, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, the saints uh, reiterate this over and over. Exitus reditus. This is a Catholic phrase you should be aware of. Exitus means um, basically from creation. We ex In a way, we exited God. We left God. Uh, not really, because we all exist in his divine mind. But we, we were all of – everything was – one with God, and then we are released from him, but we're called back to him. That exitus reditus is a kind of a return. The reditus is like returning to God. And so we need to be, we have exited in a way, and we have to be always focused on that reditus. And that is the focus of, for your child. We're called to make it in our, our life's work, to make it back to God and not follow the wide path. You can see a quote from Pope Francis, every time we give in to selfishness and say no to God, we spoil his loving plan for us. And unless we forget um, the parable of the uh, seed sower. So your children right now, um, seeds are being thrown to them. And is it the packed soil where birds come and take the seeds? That is the God, basically graces, uh, basically God's people preaching the gospel to, them, to your son or daughter. And, um, and the birds, Jesus says actually, he goes into this, this uh, parable. He doesn't go in and explain all of them. But he explains that these are people that are waiting to prey on people that are uncatechized. These are heretics. These are people that have faulty understandings. And Jesus warns that they're not going to be okay. Our modern gospel of today's life is that we're all heaven-bound by nature. And we are all going to heaven no matter what we do. And they'll find a way and everyone's going. That is not how the early Christians saw things. That is not how the apostles saw things. That is not how... Almost any saint throughout history until about 50 years ago saw things. The sower went out to sow. You really have to be aware that there are birds coming to scoop up the seeds that have been planted for your children. I, as a secondary educator, can do only so much. The primary educator is really the one that has to unpack that soil with the child. Okay, and finally, uh, we have this. We have people going the narrow road, carrying the cross up to Jesus to get a crown, but a crown of thorns. We have this wide road where everyone's having a good time. The devil's up here playing his little banjo or whatever, and then everyone's going to get eaten by monsters. Anyway, it's a scary image, but it's an image that kind of calls to mind what we're talking about here. Uh, St. Basil the Great says, Hell can't be made attractive, so the devil makes attractive the road that leads there. Remember that the training your children to avoid as soon as possible that Maslow hierarchy of needs focus, of being comfortable, well-fed, and entertained, that's the leash that is around them. So that's called vice, and it is particularly the vice against uh, temperance. If you can get them away from the vice against temperance and to build fortitude, you free them from this uh, this road. Um, one of my favorite saints wrote a, wrote a book called Orthodoxy. Not saints, maybe one day. G.K. Chesterton, he says, just going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. <laughs> He also says, there are those who hate Christianity and call their hatred an all-embracing love for all religions. And so this is the world we're living in. Back in the day, people were like, oh, G.K. Chesterton, Gilbert Keith, you don't know what you're talking about. But actually, I mean, we're living in the dystopia that he was warning about. Your children are being raised in that, in that world. Okay, so we have orthodoxy and orthopraxy. What does that mean? So ortho means right, correct, or straight. Doxy means doctrine. Praxy means practice. And pathy means emotion. So we have to be between all three of these. So oftentimes we are too, we emote too much, our, our children emote too much, and we always want to mollycoddle them and meet them where they are. And we say that they're a soft soul and they have strong emotions and they're an empath. But actually, perhaps that could be vice that we need to temper in the child. And that, frankly, is not always the role of the teacher at a young age to tell them to kind of knock it off. We try to do what we can in class, but we but we have to meet them where they are. That's really more of a role for the primary educator to say, you know, you're okay, it's gonna be okay, like calm down, you're fine. And parents do this, I hear them do it all the time. Not all parents do it though. And so it's very helpful to know that it's, it's our role to, to form children in orthopathy, orthopraxy. So it's not enough to love um, uh, Jesus a whole bunch if you're not showing that love. The Baltimore Catechism back in the day used to say, 
Um, basically, the purpose of life is to know, love, and serve God in this world. And so you, if you can't know what uh, – I'm sorry, to know, love. Yes, you can't love what you don't know. You have to know it first. And if it's all lovable like God is, then you will naturally want to serve that, that lovable thing. And orthodoxy. This is oftentimes the, the case where people say, oh, well, I mentioned God in my religion class, or I mentioned God at home. We talk about God all the time. But what does that mean? And is that, is that, that God, your version of God, is it the flying spaghetti monster? Is it a, the real, authentic, Catholic version of God? Or is it your version? We're living in a very Protestant, secular worldview down here in Texas. And so our, our, how affected – it's not even are you. How impacted, how affected are you by the Protestant theology that is around, which is non-denominational Christianity? Are you, how affected? What percentage are you? Even I, who try deliberately all the time to inoculate myself against this, it, it strikes me sometimes that well, I'll answer somebody something, and I realize that is not orthodoxy. That is not the Catholic faith with a lowercase O, not a capital O. That is uh, like the denomination of Christianity. Um, orthodoxy. This just means to be a, uh, an authentic Catholic, to believe what Catholics believe. Okay, so the goal is to be right in the middle of this, um, to have the right emotions with the right doctrine and the right practice. And when we're right here, we're walking, um, you might say, uh, let's see, I'm going to go back. Yeah, right there. We're, we're walking on this path, is the idea. Okay, so moving forward, now we're going to go to... Lex Arami, Lex Credendi. We have Martin Luther saying, as someone who went to Catholic school, which is a common thing for non-practicing Catholics today, to say, well, I was a Catholic, the nuns cracked my knuckles. They always, the, the less Catholic, the more vicious the nuns tended to be for some reason with them. I sometimes call the question whether that was true by asking the nun's name, and they can almost never tell me, or they make up the most token nun's name. I'm basically saying I don't believe that those stories are true, some of them. But um, Lex Arami, Lex Credendi. This is called the law of prayer is the law of belief. I'm not going to read through all of this. I'll send it to you. But literally, it means the law of prayer, the law of belief. But how we interpret it in Latin is the way you pray informs what you believe. And so the mass you take your children to, the, 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 the choice of prayers in the way you pray with your children affect their understanding of God, the church, the, their, the, the way they get to heaven. And so if I only show them certain saints and not other saints, so they're going to start to be affected by this. And so if we make uh, prayer a joyful time of familial togetherness, that is, what, that's, that is what it means to pray for the child. If we make prayer through our word and deed a grave communication to the King of kings and Lord of lords, the creator and sustainer of the universe, who also happens to be our loving father and brother, that is the father and the son, it informs our understanding of God, the world he has created, all the creatures within it, and the existence itself. A lot of people will often bring in prayers from Jesus Calling, a book that's Protestant that, was, that involves kind of a weird occultic spiritual inner – you basically pray inwardly, and it's, it's influenced by New Ageism. It's not a good book, but people are like, but it's called – it has Jesus on the cover, and, and it, but it's not Catholic. It's understanding of the person you're praying to is incorrect, and the way they pray to him is incorrect, and it's actually inculcating, informing their understanding of Jesus. Now, go figure fast forward 15 years from now, and let's see if that's a practicing Catholic adult. Sometimes it is, by the grace of God, but sometimes it's not. If Mass is a fellowship reunion each week during which we greet one another, sing about our togetherness, focus on one another, and our understanding of Catholicism is shaped by this and our theology, our theology will follow. If we make Mass the propitiatory re representation of the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, Calvary by the priest in an unbloody manner, in expiation for the sins of Adam, and the Eucharist is indeed the source and summit of the prayer, of the, the prayer life of the church, then our theology will reflect that. Now you go, whoa, that's a serious... Serious definition there of the liturgy. That's the church's definition of the liturgy. If it's a big welcoming committee and it's a fellowship of family and that's it, then they're going to find a better one, a more fun one. Primarily, Protestants get to make a fellowship way more fun because they don't have the Eucharist. They don't have a faith tradition like like chant and, and, and like um, um, you know other forms of like hymnody that has been in the church for thousands of years. 
This is a rich tradition, and if we do not pass on, frankly, what is justly their, their, pos their, their um, patrimony that is given to them, like an heirloom, if we do not give this to the children, they're, they don't, you're not forming their appetite. My uncle used to say to, uh, that to my parents when he would, right around the time my, my cousin was turning 21, my uncle would give him only the finest of whiskeys and the finest of beers. And my mom was like, why are you doing this? She said, my, my uncle said, because if I give him a taste for the finest, when he goes to all these high school parties, I'm not saying to raise your kids this way, this is not <laughs> but he will not like any of the beer or any of the drinks, you know, the, the, um, the, the weird peppermint schnapps that somehow ends up at every high school party. He, they'll go, oh, I don't like any of this. I'm not going to come here and hang out. And they'll be on the straight and narrow. Well, that's my uncle's way of doing it, not the best way to do it. But the point is, if you form them with the finest that, that Christianity has, Catholicism, and the patrimony that's been passed down through the ages, through tradition, they'll look at the other churches and see how shallow they are, and they won't want it. But if you basically make our faith like them so much, but we can't meet, we can't outdo them, we can't put a Starbucks in our narthex like they can, well, they're going to find that they got a better narthex, and sure enough, they leave. Okay, so here we go. So you can see that we got like Father Folk Mass here, and we got um, Cardinal um, Schoenborn here writing a wish on a balloon and letting it go up into the church. Um, and we have a lot of silly and silliness as opposed to the Rorate Chaley Mass, which, if you've never heard of that, that's your patrimony. That's what should have been shown to you. And if you don't know what a Rorate Chaley is, Mass is, you should look it up. It's during uh, Lent, and it's, um, it's said at Mass at dawn. And it's traditional. Every year we do it, and um, it's been passed down through the ages. They say it when everyone's in the dark, and, and, the, and the, ch the people are singing their uh, liturgical music by candlelight. And um, it sounds like the, the, the music that Deacon Bob plays um, out in the narthex when you walk into church in the morning. And as the dawn rises, arise, as the sun rises, you can start to see everyone around you. When you're first in there, it seems like you're in an abyss. You're just in the dark. You can only see what's going on in the altar. And children are filled with wonder at this. They, they see the mystery of what's going on. They can't sometimes always hear the priest, but they see the incense going up, and it reminds them of the whole liturgy is a catechesis in itself. And the children pick up on things that sometimes we adults don't even see. And so if we deny this of our children, I mean, it, it, it's sad, and it's tough. It's like, it's like having a wonderful... My friend was is his parents came from Austria, and he didn't really know much about Austria until his dad died of cancer. And his dad gave him his old Austrian jacket, if you know what it looks like. It's got some kind of like elk buttons, and it has a it has no collar here and stuff. It's kind of a traditional Austrian, and it had a hat. But his his son his son my friend at college said I was robbed of my patrimony of what was justly due to me from the culture that I was born into. I do not know my own family and our lineage. And so I feel like a foreigner to my own family. And so many Catholic young people today feel like foreigners to their authentic faith because they've, they've been given kind of a, a Protestantized version. Okay, let's move on. Culpability. This is actually my former students here. We went out in the woods and we tried to build a shelter. Why would I put that here? Because while out there, I knew that I was the living exemplar of the faith, a co one of them, uh, other than the parents, as God intended, and so um, as we were out there, we put camping paint on, and we built this fort they're all sitting on and stuff. But I knew the entire time that you're also, when you're doing these things, I want to find something that's not in the classroom, but also with students. And so you have a responsibility for a fault, a blameworthiness, and a guilt. That is what culpability means. But if you don't know that that's your God-given responsibility to be the primary educator, you're not as culpable. Meaning you shouldn't feel as bad necessarily, but now that you know, then now you are a little more culpable. It's kind of like degree of gu guiltness. So um, I'll, I'll go through this real quick, but try to avoid the do as I say, not as I do uh, things, because they're watching your the way you act. Um, acts of religion and observances are key. Uh, you can see that somebody is on their phone instead of watching their baby. Um, you can see that um, a whole bunch, yes, you can start to see that eventually, when you're on your phones, they're like bored. Well, then they really want that. Now they got it. And now they're, you're, they're not listening. And this is a common thing today because we, we need to cook. We need to pay the bills. We need to occupy the kids so we can do our things. And sometimes that, that uh, is, is tough. 
The precepts of the church, I just want to go over this real quick. The precepts are to go to Mass and refrain from unnecessary work on Sundays and Holy Days. Observe the laws of fasting and abstinence. Confess our sins to a priest at least once a year, usually during Lent, before Easter. Receive Holy Communion at least once a year. Folks, it wasn't so common it, it, throughout the church's history, going up to receive the Catholic High Five, that is the, um, the, the, the Eucharist, that wasn't just a sign that you were Catholic and that everyone who's Catholic got to do that. And Protestants, who sometimes are actually more practicing um, than, than some other Catholics, even though they're Protestants, they don't get to go up. And so you just need to be called a Catholic and go through the First Communion ceremony there, and now you suddenly get to receive. If you're in a state of uh, mortal sin, then you don't get to receive. And it's very common that Catholics back in the day, and some churches, don't receive. They have to consider before they go to Mass, am I in a state of grace? Once a year was the way, actually. You couldn't receive the Eucharist except once a year. There was a time, actually, that it was like you could only go to confession once in your lifetime in the early church. And so you really had to make it count when you were going to go. And then you had to have your, – your penance was like all these – you have to wear wool shirts and put ashes all over yourself for like the entirety of Lent. And so, hey, we got a better – sometimes when we make it a little easier, um, people don't try so hard. Contribute, contribute to the support that is uh, of the church, tithe. Obey the laws of the church in regards to marriage. Hey, that's one that's often people are like, oh, that seems like kind of a minor one compared to all those things. But in today's world, it's more, more important than more than ever. Uh, participate in the church's mission of evangelization. It is your job to go out there and preach the gospel, to force your uh, opinion on other people, as today would say, as people would say today. Okay, educational philosophies of the Protestant secular schools. I, I put a picture of the French Revolution where you have some people who are um, presumably okay with the Republican uh, French Revolution. We have a bunch of Catholics here who were killed from their faith. And um, these are the people that, but first I wanna to go to the Protestant uh, Reformation. So the Reformation of Perspicuity, this is key. Uh, John Wycliffe read banned books and uh, they were banned because they came up with ideas that are actually from not Christianity, but more Gnosticism. And this led uh, for him to be called the proto-reformer. Um, creating a lot of the ideas that Jan Hus, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Thomas Cramner, the Wesley brothers who created um, um, uh, Methodism from Thomas Cramner's um, Anglicanism. Uh, all of this comes from this occultic um, uh, books. Every denomination of Protestantism. Um, now we have something called the magisterium. Magister in Latin means teacher. So we look to the magisterium guided by the Holy Spirit to be the, per the, 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 the definer of what is uh, the right way and how to get to heaven. God did not, Jesus did not give us a Bible. He gave us the church and the church. St. Augustine says, I would not believe the Bible if the church did not tell me to. And so, um, so here is the, you presumably, uh, the magisterium that is St. Peter's. We have the saints. We also have the lives of the saints. It's not whoever is currently in the Vatican that defines things. It has to jive with all of tradition. And the Holy Spirit works that way. Um, we have, but, but the Protestants have the five solas. Sola Christus, sola fide, sola gratia, sola scriptura, and sola deo gloria. Deo gloria. And so basically the big one is sola scriptura, meaning if it's not in the Bible, it's not true, and we only listen to the Bible. Uh, sola gratia, well, I would like to go into these, but I don't want to go over time. So these are from John Calvin, but the one I want to focus on is total depravity. Oftentimes, we Catholics, we totally don't trust humanity, and we focus on the fallen depravity of man. That is, you've been bitten by Protestants, Protestantism, my friend. That is not a Catholic worldview. We are not, it's not our job to wonder what Father's doing with the tithing. It's not our job to say, hey, how, how do you get that car there? That's a pretty nice car. It's not our job also to judge and look at other people and, and to look into things like that. It's our job to focus on ourselves and getting into heaven. When you start to have that total depravity, folks, I know it sounds like I'm lecturing you, but the thing is, when you have a look, a, a worldview of total depravity influenced by the Protestant world that we're living in down in Texas, your children pick that up and go figure that they start to think like a Protestant because they don't know the difference between Catholics and Protestants. So here we go. I have a picture of, uh, I mean, with children here, but... Um, some, some Catholics being hung in a, in a church that's been destroyed by, by saints, by monks, uh, well, they have monks and nuns here. And so for three years, the Medici Pope, uh, Pope Leo X, followed his words, God gave us the papacy, let us enjoy it. So he was the Pope during Martin Luther and the Reformers, and he was busy eating 30 course meals. They had a big spoon that they put down their throat to clear their stomach so they could keep eating. 
For three years, no response to re reformation. And the Diet of Worms, uh, from the 95 Theses to the Diet of Worms, nothing was really done for a counter-reformation. The Gutenberg Printing Press, meanwhile, had three years of a head start to put all the propaganda out there to make the Catholic Church seem horrible, and the people, relatively uncatechized, took the bait. So they created these pamphlets. They wrote the Bible in vernacular. Now, why do Catholics not exactly want the Bible uh, in the vernacular at this time? Because the people were farmers. They were not very well catechized. They couldn't exactly always read the uh, commentary of the Catholic Church, so they took their own interpretation of the Bible. There's an authentic interpretation. Now, the reason I'm even talking about this is perspicuity. Perspicuity, the Protestants removed the magisterium and replaced it with something called perspicuity. That is, the Bible is clear in itself, that you can interpret the Bible correctly because the Holy Spirit helps each individual interpret the Bible correctly. Catholics don't believe that. And so when we focus on reading the Bible, and I don't need the Pope, I don't need the priest, I'm just going to read the Bible, Christ will teach me through the Bible, we don't believe that the Holy Spirit does that the way that Protestants do. We have to have the commentary from the church that for, so we have the authentic understanding of each verse in the Bible. And so, um, also, removed, uh, they removed hierarchy for a democracy, and this is the beginnings of... Uh, they have representative ministers and things, which is the beginning of republicanism with the French Revolution. So finally, we get into Freemasonry in the Age of Revolution. Freemasonry basically is the belief that the soul can either be base or noble, like the noble metals, noble gases, things like this, or base, like lead versus gold. So it's up to us. It's actually influenced by um, a, a, an occultist named Pico della Mirandola and Marsilio Ficino. Um, they basically um, believe that man, when he dies, can become an angel or a demon, which we do not, Catholics do not believe this. This is influenced more from the Kabbalah than it is actually from Catholic social teaching, Catholic doctrine. And so this is actually what uh, John Wycliffe got into as well. And so because of this, it influenced um, not only all of Protestant, the Protestant um, uh, theology in some ways at the beginning, but also it started to influence um, Freemasonry, because many of the first Freemasons were obviously Catholic. And so Freemasons believe that knowledge frees man to grow in perfection over time. So progress, the idea to be a progressive is to believe that over time things become more and more perfect. But the church does not ascribe to that. And so, so man must have unfettered access to all knowledge, even confusing knowledge, or knowledge that may lead one astray if understood uh, incorrectly. The church does not believe that that in, in, in the freedom of the presses, the freedom of the presses was called for to free humanity from the chokehold that the church had on all knowledge, is what their understanding was. So the French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille, um, the creation of a Republican calendar to replace Catholic feast days. Have you ever noticed when I email you and I say, good afternoon on this feast of Saint, who's the saint to say, Louis the Ninth? Is it, or is that yesterday? St. Louis the Ninth. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great thing. So um, the reason I do that is to reclaim our Catholic um, patrimony. That this is how Catholics used to talk to one another. And so instead, now we have the International Day of uh, Pancakes, International Day of Set Grandparents. This International or <laughs> National Day of whatever is from this, is from the Republican calendar. It is not, this is why I don't celebrate those National Bosses Day. I let my co-workers kind of give it to me or whatever, but I, I don't really celebrate it in my heart because this is from the Republican calendar, the people, frankly, that sent Catholics to the guillotine. So we have a posterity, we have our patrimony, we have a calendar. And so, uh, but anyway, um, I remember that the British called this, this Republican calendar, which is, this is like January, February, March, well, here's the actual days. They called it like Sneezy, Wheezy, and all these other names, uh, Breezy, because you can see it's the, basically the names of the months are about the flowers that grow there or the season, the, the, the weather. You can see that each day we have the day of the apple. So we celebrate apples on this day instead of saints. They had to replace it. Think of your children. You can't just say don't do that. You have to say do this instead. When they tried to de-Catholicize France in the French Revolution, they said we'll have the day of the apple, the day of the celery. And they would celebrate the universe giving celery to us. Well, this is not so good. We also got the metric system. That's great. That's fine. But we also got the encyclopedia. 
which was the Dennis Diderot's uh, attempt to try to take knowledge and give it to the people because the church was the only, all the universities and all the schools were created by the Catholic Church with a Catholic worldview, and they wanted to take that from the Catholics and, and, and create secularism from it. This is the posterity, the, 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 the lineage from where we get public schools. Um, then we have the temple, the, the cult of reason, where they, to replace Mary, uh, the Blessed Mother, they had to create a goddess. If you go down to Austin and you look at the top of our capital, we have a lady, Lady Liberty. Lady Liberty is Mary, but the Republicans, that is with a lowercase r, that is people that believe in a representative government, that is not the Catholic monarchy that, frankly, the Catholic Church and the saints have always looked to. Christ is a king. He's not a president or a dictator or, a dictator or even a, um, any form of representative government. And so we have um, – we have uh, to replace Mary, they had processions because French people love processions. They're very Catholic. So they had the procession of uh, Lady uh, of Reason. And then we have uh, another – Cult of reason, where there's another kind of lady uh, of reason, basically. Here's they actually went, they stormed Notre Dame, tore all the Mary statues out, all the saints out. They ripped down the crucifix and they put uh, a Republican um, goddess of reason, and they called it the Temple of Reason. Our, you know the Notre Dame that that uh, Notre Dame that burned down or whatever the roof. Um, and and so that was the way they had to replace Catholicism. Hey, we're living in the dystopia after that all happened, that people were warning about, that the saints were going to the guillotine saying, this is what's going to happen if we don't do something. And so the church never condoned the revolution, and we're living influenced by a country that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which was the French revolutionary document that started the French Revolution. That's our Thomas Jefferson. The church has spoken out about the evils of, of the revolution hundreds or even thousands of times. It was the archetype for the Marxist revolutions and the populist uprisings for generations, and even still today. Remember when we're all taking our masks off, thankfully, and going into our house during COVID, and we're watching as cities are burning down across America? They were using the French Revolution as that archetype, and frankly, the wars of religion, when Protestants would go into Catholic villages and, and tear them all up. That is also where this comes from. It comes from the same lineage. Although some good things came from the French Revolution, like the metric system and things like this, for, uh, from a Catholic perspective, it led to the culture where we're living in today. And to send your kids to public school, if you're not inoculating them against some of these ideas, you're just getting that all of that was a good thing and we're better off for it. And most Catholic schools teach this way. We also have uh, here another cult of reason here. Um, and we have a uh, Catholic nun and monk being put in a boat. They actually had a cork that they would put the boat out into the uh, this Seine River. And then they pull the cork and they would sink the they, – they tied uh, nuns and monks to it. They called it a Catholic wedding. And that's what they did during the French Revolution. That's the revolution we celebrate. Okay, and then we have Charlotte Corday who had had enough. And she goes and actually murders – the, the, uh, the guy who's writing a lot of these stories, there was a guy writing a hit list of all Catholics, and anyone who, when they read the newspapers, they'd go and kill that Catholic. They would tell where, where he lived and everything. Well, Charlotte Corday was like, all right, enough of this. And so she went to try to stop it. She's not a saint, so it's not necessarily what you should do. But there, there, was, a, I mean, there was a huge culture war between the Catholics and the French revolutionaries. They killed the Catholic monarch here, and eventually this is stained glass window where these French um, saints are. And here we have the Carmelite nuns that were sent to the, the guillotine. I think I'm, I'm dri driving the point home, but we had the, a war of Catholics in the Vendee region called the War in the Vendee. And they had a white little sash, and they had a, a, a sacred heart on their, on their chest. And they died. They were decimated by the French. And they're now – see, this, their history is not told. If they won, it would be the only history told. But history is written by the victors. And Catholics, our Catholics, lost in France. The eldest daughter of the church does not really highlight that story anymore for its people. And so we have – let's go into education now. Okay, all that happened, and now we're going to teach our children that that was all a good thing. And so Horace Mann goes to Prussia after uh, Napoleon basically spreads – takes over <laughs> kind of winning a bunch of battles. He goes and actually informs uh, the, with the revolutionary ideas in Prussia. And Frederick the Great, uh, Frederick II. 
he creates a Prussian model of education that is the archetype or the structure that we built our educational <coughs> system on. The very one when you think of what a school looks like, our, our hallway is built off the Prussian model. It, it's, it's literally what we think of when we think of school. Carry out um, the goal of the French American Revolution. If the citizenry are not educated, all truth will come from the church or a tyrannical king. That was what he was nervous about. He looked to Frederick the Great's Prussian model of education as his template. All students are either mill workers or factory workers, or they're soldiers. And so the Prussian model was to not train them to be well-rounded, to, to pursue heaven. It was to raise mill workers or factory workers or soldiers. And that's, why the, that's where the Bell system came from. The Bell system trained factory workers to get used to that. Actually, one of their classes was to go in the factory and work. Um, or to go be a soldier and train marching around in things. You can see this in, in schools with the discipline and the docility that children should have. Um, okay. Uh, um, the day was focused on students being docile to teachers as drill sergeants and foremen. So when teachers, teachers even have these understandings sometimes. Families, uh, primary educators have this understanding of what a school is. So when they say, I don't, my children, I'm not my child's teacher, they don't go to school at my house, or when homeschool families homeschool, it doesn't look like a school, so they're like, oh, that's not really a school. But this school, is just, it was created by the people that fought and won the French Revolution and brought that over here. So we have John Dewey. John Dewey was uh, kind of a forerunner in, in something called progressivism as an educational philosophy. Progressivists believe that individuality, progress, and change are fundamental to one's education. Uh, they are not to look, in, you may go, individuality, of course. I'm American, that's kind of like, of course, if we are agreed. But listen, they don't see a member as a member of a family, as a global church, as a universal church. They, they, they don't see that their actions, um, children formed in this type of school, affect everybody else, that they are merely an extension of their family, an extension of their faith denomination, in this case Catholicism. And so um, progress, the idea that as time goes on, things naturally get better. They do not devolve, they evolve. And um, believing that people learn best from what, from what they consider most relevant to their lives, so therefore uh, Catholicism, achieving heaven, well that's not for everyone's life. You can start to see that at, fir at first glance, this sounds like a good thing, but when you see it practically applied, you can start to see that, ooh, this is quite different than Catholic education. Progressivists center their curricula on the needs, experiences, interests, and abilities of the students. That's a good thing. It just depends, but who's deciding what their needs are? It's not the people that fought and died in the Catholic Revolution of, of France. It's actually the ones who won. Teachers act as facilitators, not as teachers, but facilitators, meaning the child set essentially helps to teach themselves by deciding what they think is best to pursue. You can see this a little bit in Montessori education, which we have Montessori here. That was written by a Catholic named Maria Montessori. So she's very aware of what's going on and avoided those bad things. Common sites in a, in a progressivist um, classroom might include small group debating, which is fine in itself, custom make, but it's the idea that they decide what's true, and there isn't a truth outside of what the congregation in that small group says. Custom-made activities, learning stations, again, we do this all the time in our Catholic school, but the church is the arbiter of truth, and, and they're either getting it right or wrong, and then they're corrected afterwards. Um, progressives follow the belief that with time, society and humanity become continually perfected, applying the principles of Darwinism and the Freemasonic Republican liberalism of founding fathers, the French Revolutionary, as well as Marx and Engels. That's the problem. And you're going to see from here on out, basically, almost everybody who influenced educational philosophy, the next step after the French Revolution, the natural next step is Marxism. So you're going to start to see that every edu uh, educational philosophy after this is influenced by Marxism which is not only just next to Catholicism, it's in opposition to Catholicism. Like Catholicism's the enemy. Although they are correct about some things, the issue is their worldview is not based on truth itself and has an atheistic worldview focused on this life and making the world a better place, devoid of God and a heaven-driven purpose. And who defines what this means to make the world a better place? The individual child does. From the earliest of age in in, in, in public school, those in, with a Dewey and model of education, which is all of them, the child decides what the world, what making the world a better place is. Progressivism is focused on forming students into adults who can 
go out, participate in society as an informed citizen, and bring about one's will upon the world and make it quote unquote better. We have uh, E.D. Hirsch and essentialism. Essentialism is the idea that basically, I'm just gonna boil this down, there's these basic concepts and skills that all adults should have. My dad followed this when he was a kid. He's like, Catholic school, you're learning all this stuff, great, Jesus is wonderful, I love that, but why aren't you learning how to balance your checkbook? Why aren't they teaching you how to change your oil and document when you change your oil? They need to teach that in school, I'll tell you. That, that's essentialism. And most dads are kind of that way, a little bit. So, but that, unfortunately, that pursues this life. The telos, that is the end of that education, is to prepare for this life, but not the next. So be aware as the primary educator, especially as dads, is that your educational philosophy? Now this actually isn't influenced by Marxism. Uh, e. Hirsch said, wrote something called cultural literacy, which is the idea that he noticed that a lot of uh, Europeans that created a lot of things, you know, with colonialism and all this other stuff, or whatever you want to call it, uh, Western expansion. Well, he said, well, the Europeans aren't having a ton of kids now, and so we're going to have to give these ideas of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We've got to give all these ideas to those people who are having kids, or else we're going to kind of lose this whole thing, and we're going to go back to the jungle. And so uh, he created this list of things, these words and these concepts that if you teach them to the next generation, then hopefully this whole thing called civilization will keep going. I don't know if I buy that. That's his whole, his whole preface if you look into his cultural literacy. But um, some of those are great vocab words and things. It's not the end of the list. But um, it, is, it stresses the essential knowledge and skills every basic human should know. Think of a child like a computer and give them the basic programs that they need to be a functional member of society. But there is no heaven in this, in this world yet. Now you got Sartre, Sartre and existentialism. There's a lot of different people that I could have chosen, but Sartre is kind of a good one. Existentialism is the philosophy that the child chooses for themselves what their purpose of life is. There is no God in this worldview. It's just that it's about existence, and, and it precedes essence. And you don't need, essence means kind of that, um, well, it's kind of a longer story, I guess. But, but essentially, our individual purpose and meaning is not given to us by God's government. I copied this off of Google, so it's not me writing this. Government, teachers, or any other authorities. You choose for yourself what's right and wrong. Well, this is just the same as the French Revolution played out in a different way. Essential, existential emphasizes action, freedom, and decision as fundamental to human existence. What's the purpose of life? Not to pursue virtue and grow closer to God, but to... Um, to choose for yourself what's good. It is in opposition to rational, rationalist tradition and positivism, a.k.a. Catholicism. Google calls it this, but it's Catholicism. The goal is to form moral individuals from a, from a secular materialist, atheistic worldview. In education, teachers with this educational philosophy seek to guide students to find their own purpose, to find for themselves what the meaning of life is. And so uh, a lot, I've heard a lot of parents in parent-teacher conferences over the years in Catholic school say that that's why we send our kids to a Catholic school. And um, finally here is the most overt Marxist of them. Social reconstructionist education was based on the theory that society can be reconstructed through complete control of education. If I'm a Marxist and I want to brainwash kids, the best way to do it is to create an educational philosophy and have a whole bunch of young freshmen in college, all the way to seniors in college, learn the Marxist worldview. And the whole purpose of education is to form the minds of little ones to be Marxist. That is obviously what is going on. I mean, I can just go right through this and share it with you later if you like. Then we have Pavlov uh, and, and B.F. Skinner. Uh, behaviorism focuses on the idea that the, the purpose of education is to learn how to behave in society, to learn how to be a functioning adult and how to obey the laws and obey the rules. Um, Finally, we have the last one, Adler, perennialism. Perennialism is the closest to, Catholic, to Catholic education before uh, the French Revolution. It's the idea of perennials. Perennials are like uh, plants. They're ones that come back after winter, right? Perennialism is the idea that there's these eternal truths that over time, um, every generation is like a ratchet. And, and, and if you teach these eternal truths that, that people spent an entire life learning to the next generation, then civilization won't come unraveled the way like a ratchet, you know, a rat, you, like, you ratchet and it clicks and then it won't unravel. So every generation, the purpose of education is to teach those truths that have been passed down over the ages. And so this is why a lot of schools will, will read Shakespeare. Well, how relevant is Shakespeare today? 
They'll read the Ten Commandments, or they'll even learn about the Egyptians, and they'll learn about people that were a long time ago. Why would you do this? That's kind of a waste of your time. Well, it's because there's great uh, humanity has spent uh, a lifetime, many lifetimes, discovering and figuring things out. And then if we don't put that to the next generation, it's kind of lost. We're spinning our wheels. And so perennialism focuses on those truths. Uh, something we're doing at uh, St. Clair, that's a very perennialist educational philosophy. You could say We're learning about um, astronomy. So we're learning about the, the uh, constellations, and we're learning about um, so that we can be in touch with the ancients. We can read old poems that talk about Sagittarius or any of these others. Not astrology. Not the idea that, that oh, I'm, a, I'm a Virgo or whatever. Not that. But we're learning about so that when we read Shakespeare and his sonnets, when we read other things like this, we can understand about the, land, the, the, the world of the spheres above us and things like this. That's something that's not taught anymore because of essentialism. Because of progressivism, that's a waste of time. And I've heard parents that heard about us learning astronomy, they go, that's a waste, why are you learning that? Well, because it puts us in connection with people who learned that long ago when we are discussing the same things they're discussing. We call some of these the great discussions. This, the big capital G, capital D, the great discussion is something perennialists always talk about. Discussing who's the better hero in Homer's uh, The Iliad, is it is it Hector or is it Achilles? That's something that's been discussed by Alexander the Great, by Caesar, by, I mean, all the way until today. And so by part allowing that, that patrimony, that passed down, um, you might say, a uh, family heirloom of humanity, of, of Western civilization, to be taught to that child. And that child then takes up that mantle and in this generation discusses the great discussion. It should make your socks Shoot off your feet. It should make your air. I'm literally talking about it. And my the air is uh, the uh, hair is sticking up in the end of my of my arm here. These are wonderful things. That is the purpose of education. Catholics would teach this when before there was ever another kind of school. And so, um, but perennialism for itself, meaning secular perennialism, you, um, perennialism essentially is now called like classical education. Have you ever heard of that? And so um, there's secular classical schools, and sometimes they can be good. There's Protestant secular schools, and there's good things in those. But you definitely ideally would choose a, a – I came from a classical school, so of course that's my little agenda in there. But it, it is true. I, I challenge anybody to debate me that um, you know, perennial uh, Catholic schools are more similar to Catholic schools uh, before the French Revolution than after. Um, the more things change, the more they stay the same is a common adage that they say. So parent is primary educator. The big, the big idea is the church holds Catholic education as an utmost priority. It's where Catholic adults come from. It helps them to form saints. Parents are fallen, generally minimally catechized and busy with work and life. Yet God chose to use parents as the primary means of creating his church by rearing saints. It's the parent's job to get their child to heaven first and into a high-paying career a distant second. And chances are, if you raise a good, um, virtuous son or daughter, they will get into a uh, good, high-paying job. Because typically, what employers are looking for is trustworthy, dependable, diligent people. Those are all virtues. Um, the odds are against parents, but the church provides Catholic schools to help them in their responsibilities. Parents have to ensure that they are well informed, rooting out non-Catholic ideas and worldviews, practicing virtue and the precepts and sacraments of the church, growing in their faith, and inviting the family to do so together. And so here's a Q&A. So name one encyclical you'd like to look into. And I don't know if you know them all, but maybe, yes? The Pius the Tenth one. Yeah, that's a good one. Acerbo Nemes. I wrote a paper on that. Name the five marks of the Catholic of Catholic education. Maybe you can't remember those, but well, just think about it. Notice that you can't, perhaps. Uh, define natural law. Can anyone in their own words define natural law? A rough and ready definition. I'm going to say you're really, really close to being right if you're not right. Yes. Well, uh, that uh, things have an intended purpose and direction. Okay, as created. In other words, human sexuality is for an end in view. Yeah. And, uh, that would be a Exactly, Rich. Yes, and I would say human sexuality uh, is is the number one most mistaken in today's society. Gender, th all that type of stuff. Um, 
um, is the most misunderstood or, or, or twisted version of natural law. Yeah, um, I might add uh, too what's going on today in the French Revolution. Uh, they got rid of faith, so now it's reason alone. Today we're losing reason, so we're out of touch with even reality. Right. Man and a woman. Yes, and all that. faith has to be the the linchpin. Exactly right. So define salvation history, and anyone in their own words know how to define, as opposed to just history. What's salvation history? That's okay. I can, okay, I can answer. How about you, ma'am, in the back? Do you know? I was going to say, I was thinking of the Bible timeline, like you said, that when yeah. you enter your that, you know, the judges and yeah. so on, through to Jesus. And yeah, is that the Jeff Cavins one? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I use that as my own template when I was a teacher. Yeah. And where we find ourselves, and we're in kind of uncharted territory. We know not how long we'll be here. And yes. That's what the, the point today. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. Thank you. That's exactly right. Define orthopraxy versus orthodoxy. And if you really even know ortho, or ortho uh, Kathy, that's a, a nice one to chime in. Does anyone know what orthodoxy or orthopraxy means? Orthodoxy is the doctrine, and the practice is the practice. Yep. And, and, I, and obviously, Rich and I, being our age, Oh, yes, oh, yes. That's true, very good. And orthopathy is obviously correct emotions, especially in today's world. Uh, Lex Arani, Lex Fredendi. I'll just go to uh, take that one. Lex Arani, Lex Fredendi, boiled, it literally means law of prayer, law of belief, but it boils down, it means the way you pray influences what you believe. And, and more in this topic, how you pray with your children and in front of your children influences their understanding of their Catholic faith. If you pray like a Protestant, they're going to become a Protestant, most likely. If you pray with the rosary, if you have the saints, if you have a Mary statue, if you have a home altar, they're going to probably uh, be on the right path. Define scandal. I, I think I actually uh, skimmed through that part, but scandal is just like a stumbling block, something that it, uh, causes people to fall or trip in their faith. And so basically, scandal in this case is what we're trying to avoid. Um, is, is scandal. This is a set of precepts. Just think if you can do those, the solas. I plan to go into the more of these, but um, obviously not a lot of time. And here I was just going to ask some of you to define this stuff. Just do it in your, in your head on your way home. Like try to talk about what is this existentialism as opposed to essentialism? What's perennialism as opposed to social reconstructionism? These are educational philosophies that you have. So do I, but so do you. We all have it's because we're living in the world today. And so our understanding of what a school is and what education is after the French Revolution has been um, formed by these ideas. And um, okay, and that's the, the conclusion of my talk. Are there any questions, though, for me? Or any kind of, I took a lot of your time. But yes? Oh, well, I was just mentioning here, it's one of the areas I'm concerned about is things are moving really quickly uh, in our culture, uh, woke, all this stuff. Pedagogical methods have yet been able to come up with not just teaching people what these are, but how do we uh, uh, be able to uh, inoculate, to use your word, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, so that our young people can avoid this and parents having the tools that they need as well. I think right. this needs to be addressed now in a uh, anyway. I, yeah, I no, you're absolutely right, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to give this talk of all of, all of them to when John. And I were talking. It's because we need a kind of a, a coalition of families together talking about, you know, what is this culture where we're living in, and it, it, what you might just call entertainment, but it really is a culture war, and, and we have to meet it head on, or else we're in trouble. The first thing would be to manage cell phone and device usage with the kiddos, even as, as hard as it is. And um, sometimes it's have more kids because they can occupy each other, have an older kid hopefully that can kind of watch them, and eventually that replaces. The but if that's not an option, having analog toys and things like this really helps to replace. You will never be able to replace the world that a kid can go into and become a superhero and fly around this fake world in this video game. They start to hate the world they're in. In my experience as a teacher, the most miserable kids were the ones that were the happiest when they are playing video games because they wanted to live in that video game reality and they were resentful of the real world, and God is the real, the capital R, real. And so he essentially, we're creating children who dislike the reality that God has given us and they wanna live in an alternate one. 
and we're giving them that appetite. We're training them. Think of my uncle and his weird way of training my cousin to not go to college parties and high school parties. We have to give them a sense, an appetite of the finer things in this reality, and don't give them that junk beer, if you will. Don't give them those video games all the time. It gives them an appetite for it. And they're going to be miserable. Also, goes through your timeline when you were first outlining the church is riding on education. It like starts to accelerate exponentially. Yeah. Now. 